Hi, so this is the first and what will be a series of videos on the Feynman Lectures where I'm going to go through all three books and summarize every chapter. So starting from the beginning, this is Volume 1, Chapter 1. And um, Feynman kind of starts off the book by talking about the way physics is taught and how it's kind of a top-down approach rather than a bottom-up approach where unlike in something like uh, geometry, where you would start with Euclid's axioms, the, the most fundamental concepts of the top subject, and then build all of your understanding from there. Physics doesn't really work that way, at least in the way that it's taught, where you're taught things at a higher level, and then that slowly moves you down in understanding to a more fundamental level. And the reason for this is that we don't know all of the fundamentals of physics yet, and then the parts we do know, a lot of them are complicated both mathematically and conceptually so it's better to start out with certain approximations and assumptions and specific examples and then work our way towards those fundamental understandings of reality at least the ones that we know so far but along the way he's going to point out things that are sort of lies or approximations which a lot of teachers don't so that's pretty good and uh one example he gives he doesn't give this specific equation but um i'll write it down f is equal to ma and um, this is force is equal to mass times acceleration you've probably seen this equation before and in this equation it's assumed that mass is constant acceleration can change but whatever object you have the mass of that object is going to be constant and it turns out that that's not true the mass of an object changes with its velocity and for a long time this was assumed to be true and we, we found out that it wasn't and this equation or this assumption that mass is constant really doesn't matter unless objects are moving incredibly fast. Feynman says in the book that an object, so long as it's traveling at less than um, 100 miles per second, that its mass will be accurate within one part in one million. Meaning if you had a perfect scale and you'd measured something to be exactly one kilogram and it was uh, moving at less than 100 miles a second, that you would be accurate to within 0 0.000001 kilograms, which is a um, obviously more accurate than most scales could possibly measure, and more accurate than what would even matter in most contexts that you'd end up dealing with in everyday life and also the, the speed this 100 100 miles per second that is that that's incredibly fast for the everyday world well that's not something that we encounter that's not something that comes up and that's why in high school you're not told about this and um so that's kind of one of his specific examples or the really the only one he gives th this far as to something we're told that's really an assumption that doesn't get to the, the root understanding that we know. And um, from there he goes on to say what uh, he would pass on as information if the human race were to end and have to start over again and he could only pass down one sentence to the people starting over of all of our scientific knowledge. And I'll read it from the book. He says that the sentence would be, all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. And that sentence is important to remember because it's going to come up with uh, the, next, the next part of the chapter that I go into, that the concept that atoms are attracted to each other, but once they are forced close enough together, they repel each other. And um, the next topic he goes into is the topic of um, pressure. And he uses kind of the quintessential piston example, where you have a piston. I'm going to draw these lines going across that just show you that this is a cross-sectional cutout of this piston. And the piston is pushing down into this cylinder right here. And the cylinder has some kind of gas molecules flying around in it. And they're all just moving about, going every which way in random directions, and bouncing off the walls, bouncing off each other. And as, as all of these particles are bouncing all around, they're gonna keep hitting this piston. And 
the average force from all of this bumping against the piston from these air molecules that the piston feels, that uh, average force is the force that the piston feels. It, um, it can't comprehend every little push, which is like uh, when you feel something push against you, you're, you're feeling the average, you're not feeling all of the individual atoms, obviously, or individual molecules. So he then goes on to say, kind of bringing it back to another assumption, which th this part I found really interesting because I'd never thought about this before. You've probably seen this example before, talking about mass. If you've watched any science documentary that goes into special relativity or uh, the things that Einstein discovered in his work, you've probably heard this example. But I, um, what he said about pressure was something I'd never thought about before. So obviously, if you push this piston down, you're going to get more pressure, right? By the way, um, pressure or this... Um, Pressure P is equal to force divided by area. So the average force of all of these particles pushing on the piston and then divided by the area of the piston. So you make the area of the piston larger, but keep the force the same. You have lower pressure, make the area smaller, but keep the force the same. You're going to have more pressure. And then obviously raise the force, lower the force. The pressure is going to change um, proportionally to that force. So what he says is, if you hold this piston in place, and we're pretending this is all perfectly sealed, nothing can escape, nothing can come in. Um, if you hold this piston in place and you pump more air into here, say you make it so there's double the air, then the pressure will double because there's twice as many particles to all bump against this piston. And um, he, he says how if you, if you think about his quote from earlier about how the atoms will repel each other once they get pushed in closer to each other, but they're also, they also have that attractive force, that those two forces might cancel out to an extent, and you might end up having it be a wash if you add more particles into here. And, um, but that's not true, as, as we know from everyday life and from maybe other classes you've taken, that no, when you, when you pump more air into a closed space, the, the pressure obviously it rises it doesn't it doesn't um, not change and um, so I'll write that down as P for pressure lowercase p is proportional which this alpha lowercase alpha means proportional and then this row is density so pressure is proportional to density meaning if density increases pressure increases vice versa and um, what's interesting about this, is that this is actually also an assumption, just like what we talked about with our mass. So there is still that force of attraction between all of these molecules that is fighting this outward pressure. And he says in the book that that pressure, or that, that um, attractive force doesn't come into play in any way that, um, that makes it so that this proportionality is wrong in any measurable way or any any way that really matters just like in our mass example here unless the density is very high whatever that means he doesn't go into the specifics of that but um i thought that that was very interesting the fact that this proportionality between density and pressure is actually just an approximation and just like with our mass example up here there's probably some zero with a lot of zeros after it and some number down the line of inaccuracy in this assumption. So that is a, that's a pretty interesting part of this chapter. And I'm sure later on in the book, just like everything he covers in this chapter, we're going to actually go into the details of how you calculate these things and what exactly is the difference between this truly being proportional and not and why and all of those things. So that's exciting to go farther on. Um, the next thing he talks about in the chapter, and, and this chapter is all slight introductions, like what you're seeing here to topics that are going to be covered, because uh, just to show, get you interested and show you what you're going to be learning. So that's why it's not like a real deep dive. But um, the next topic he goes into, I'll draw this little line right here. The next topic he goes into is he describes a cup with water in it. So you have the surface of water right here, and um, these water molecules are all bouncing around, hanging out, and um, one of them happens to get knocked out of the water, right? And that's the process of evaporation. One of the molecules acquires more energy than the average of the ones surrounding it, and throughout this body of water in this cup, it escapes, goes out into the environment. That's evaporation. 
vaporization, whatever you want to call it. Um, something that I hadn't really thought about is the fact that this water vapor that's in the air up here also can happen to find its way back into the water. So this is really not just a one-way street of evaporation. It's a dynamic process where water is both evaporating out into the air, becoming water vapor, and it's also coming back into its liquid form and rejoining the water. And the reason over time, if you leave a cup out, it all ends up evaporating is just because the rate at which the water is leaving is greater than the rate at which it's coming back. And um, then he describes a situation where you have a lid on the cup and says how with this lid on the cup that eventually as more of the water turns into water vapor the rate at which vapor is leaving the water is going to decrease because there's less water there's there's less molecules to have the chance to do that and as there's more vapor there's a greater chance of one of these molecules rejoining the water so the rate at which water is leaving its liquid form is going to decrease the rate at which water is leaving the vapor form is going to increase, and then you'll eventually reach a, state, reach a state of equilibrium where water is leaving and returning at the same rate, and you will see this water level just stay constant. I should have drawn this as a, uh, a flat line across. I shouldn't have drawn it wavy. It's a little misleading because the water's still. But, um, but anyway, so... This water that you leave here for, say, 20 years, assuming that this is perfectly sealed, it might look like it's just flat and unmoving the entire time, but in reality, it's been a dynamic process where it's leaving and returning the entire time. And then if you open this lid up, the water vapor is going to escape, and then the process, the balance is thrown off, and then this water can start evaporating again. You'll see the water level start to lower. One important takeaway from this is that the Water molecules that escape have more energy than the average energy of the water molecules surrounding them. And because of that, they're going to lower the temperature by leaving. Because they're, they're, the, the temperature is the average kinetic energy. And if that molecule has more energy than the average, then by it leaving, it's going to lower the average. Same thing with these vapor molecules coming back. They, are, they have more energy than the average energy in the liquid form, so when they join, they're going to be raising the temperature. So that's why when uh, like you get alcohol on your skin and it evaporates really rapidly, your skin feels cold because the alcohol is taking energy with it. And um, that, uh, that concept, he explains, is why if you have a spoon that has some soup in it and it's hot, and there's steam coming off, right? Why does blowing on the soup make it cool down? Well, when you blow on the soup, you're making it so that the steam that's right above it is constantly getting pushed away. So you're decreasing the rate at which the vapor is returning. And remember, the vapor returning has higher energy. It's gonna keep this soup hotter for longer. But by continually removing it, you're increasing the proportion of particles that are leaving, vaporizing, taking energy with them, versus particles coming back with more energy and keeping it as warm as it, as it is. So I thought that that was a very interesting takeaway and something that I have never thought about before. Um, one other thing he touches on is that uh, if you have water, another part of this dynamic system is that there's air molecules, oxygen and nitrogen working their way into the water, also working their way out of the water. Another dynamic process where one side of it can take over and that's why there's air increasing in the water or decreasing because one, uh, there's more leaving than is coming back or vice versa, but it's never really just one way or the other. Even though it might seem that way, it's just that the proportion of air leaving or returning is greater than the other side. That's why it seems to be one way or the other. And um, the last topic that he kind of touches on is, um, is carbon burning and oxygen. And he says how oxygen, like you've probably seen, likes to bond to itself. So you usually have O2 in the air. And when carbon burns, carbon likes to bond with oxygen more than oxygen likes to bond with itself and more than carbon likes to bond with itself. So the carbon can grab on 
to one of these oxygens and another carbon grabs onto the other and can form two um, carbon monoxide molecules. And uh, as this burn is allowed to go on for longer, you can end up with a carbon dioxide molecule. As this, after this carbon monoxide molecule bonds with another oxygen. And he says how in a process where the burn is really quick and releases a lot of energy very fast, like in an engine where, um, you know, the, the spark plug burn, the, uh, the gas that comes into the piston, that um, you'll mostly have just carbon monoxide because there's not enough time for this carbon dioxide to form. And um, if you have an example where, say, you have a bonfire, that there will be CO2 because it has time in that slow burn to, um, to come into existence and uh, th through um, bonding. And um, one other thing he says about this is that this process of these bonds forming releases a lot of energy, which can be felt in the form of hot air. But if the energy is, um, is great enough, it can release light. And that's what we see as flames. So that's just another interesting thing that he touches on and doesn't really go into much detail with. Um, I, think, I think that's about it. There is one other thing that he covers that I didn't mention about how uh, liquids are um, liquids because their molecules don't have defined positions and that when they cool and become solids that all of their, uh, all of their molecules are in rigid fixed positions where if you know where one is because you know the way they're all laid out, you could know from this exact distance from that specific molecule, I'll have another molecule right here oriented in whatever way. You'd be able to know that by knowing the position of any one. And um, he doesn't go into much detail about that. Uh, it, that's, I find, a little confusing as an introduction because you start to wonder, but aren't these molecules always moving around? And uh, what exactly causes these changes of phase? What makes that liquid change into a solid? And he doesn't go into it here, but um, like I said, this chapter is just a brief introduction and so are the next couple, and I think it's chapter four where we really get a deep dive into, I think, I believe the chapter is about um, potential and kinetic energy. So yeah, I think that's it for this video, and uh, make another one soon.